Last time, we talked about carbohydrates, the source of energy our body uses to power all functions of the cell. However, with simple carbohydrates, we can't perform these actions. So how does our body move from carbohydrate sources like glucose into usable energy that the body can use? Well, the body uses a process called glycolysis. Glyco meaning glucose, lysis meaning to split up. Now, what is the overall reaction of glycolysis? Well, looking at it simply, we have one glucose, two NAD pluses, two ADPs, and two, and we're shifting to two pyruvates, two H plus ions, two ATPs, and two NADHs. Now, looking at glycolysis, we have to answer a few questions before we can look at the overall path of glycolysis. Looking at these questions, we have to ask, why is it that the standard delta G of many of these reactions is different from the free energy delta G that we see in our body? This is because the standard delta G represents these reactions in a vacuum. However, in our body with the free energy delta G, it represents these reactions amidst many other factors, like concentration of substrate, of product, of cofactor, or the enzyme itself, which gives us, as it ends up, significantly different delta G free energy versus delta G standard. Another question we have to answer before glycolysis is regulation. Why does the body regulate glycolysis and how does the body regulate glycolysis? The body regulates glycolysis because if the body did not regulate glycolysis, cells would use energy faster or slower than the body needs them. The body can tell how much energy we need due to concentrations of the product or the substrate for this reaction. If the body senses too much ATP, many of these enzymes will stop, they will inhibit, and glycolysis will shut down. However, many of these same enzymes are activated by AMP. After the body has broken down ATP into ADP, and after ADP has been broken down into AMP, many of these enzymes will sense AMP and will activate, spurring glycolysis and allowing for more energy to be pumped into cells. Getting past that, we can look at the major steps of glycolysis. First, we have one glucose molecule, and an enzyme called hexokinase changes it into glucose 6-phosphate. Many enzyme names can be complex or confusing. However, looking at the components of the enzyme name can help us to infer the enzyme's use without explicitly being told so. Hexo, meaning six, kinase, meaning adding or subtracting a phosphate group, gives us an enzyme that will add or subtract a phosphate group from a six carbon molecule. Looking at that, we can see that bears out in reality as glucose, a six carbon molecule, is transferred to glucose six phosphate. Going to the next step, we have glucose six phosphate being turned into fructose six phosphate by phosphoglucose isomerase. Phospho, meaning has a phosphate group, glucose, meaning of glucose, and isomerase. Hmm. I see the word isomer in there, which suggests to me that this enzyme will change a phosphoglucose into an, is an isomer of itself. And we can see that as glucose 6-phosphate becomes its isomer, fructose 6-phosphate. Moving on to the next step, we can see the enzyme 
phosphofructokinase is transferring fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Hmm. I'm starting to see a pattern here. Looking at the molecule of the enzyme, we can see phospho, meaning has a phosphate group, fructo, meaning pertaining to fructose, kinase, which suggests to me that the enzyme is putting a phosphate group on a phosphofructose. We can see this as it goes from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-biphosphate. This prepares us for the next step, where the body breaks up fructose 1,6-biphosphate into two smaller molecules. Now, the enzyme that does this is aldolase. Hmm. Aldolase. I see the word aldol in there, which suggests to me that an aldol or an aldol reaction is going to be involved. Looking at this overall reaction, we can see that the enzyme performs a reverse aldol reaction, acting upon an aldol within fructose 1,6-biphosphate to split it into two smaller groups. Now the two molecules that we get after this step are G3P and DHAP. However, the body can't use DHAP. It needs G3P to continue glycolysis. In order to fix this, the body uses TPI, triose phosphate isomerase, meaning it's taking a triose, this three carbon sugar here that has a phosphate on it, and turning it into an isomer of itself, namely G3P. Looking to the next step, we see that G3P undergoes the enzyme glycerate phosphate dehydrogenase, and at the end, it has another phosphate on it. Well, hold on. Glycerate phosphate dehydrogenase. That's not a kinase. It's not adding or subtracting a phosphate group, and yet there's a phosphate group at the end of the reaction. What's happening? Glycerate phosphate dehydrogenase meaning it will dehydrogenate a glycerate phosphate, allows this reaction to take place by dehydrogenating the molecule, allowing for a free phosphate to bind to it, forming 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate undergoes another reaction, phosphoglycerate kinase. Now this is a kinase which means it's going to be adding or subtracting a phosphate group from phosphoglycerate. From this, we can see it does. It takes away a phospho group forming two ATP based on the two molecules undergoing this reaction. Now, it transfers that into 3PG, this molecule here. This molecule here undergoes a different reaction from the ones that we've seen before. 3PG undergoes the enzyme phosphoglycerobutase. Phosphoglycero relating to a, glycerin, a glycerate molecule with a phosphate group on it. Mutase suggesting that the molecule is going to be mutated in some way, changed. We can see this as it repositions the phosphate group from the third position of the molecule to the second position of the molecule, forming 2PG. 2PG, very close to pyruvate at this point, undergoes another reaction. It undergoes enolase. Enolase forms an enol bond within this molecule, leading the molecule to PEP. PEP, the penultimate substrate for this overall reaction, then undergoes one final reaction with pyruvate kinase. Hmm. Now pyruvate kinase, suggesting that it's involving pyruvate and it's adding or subtracting a phosphate group. Well, with this, we can see that it's taking a phosphate group off of PEP and forming pyruvate.
With this, it forms an additional two ATP for the two molecules within the reaction. Overall, glycolysis takes glucose, many cofactors, NADH and two ATP, ADP, and turns it into pyruvate, two H plus ions, two ATP ions, and two NADH ions. This allows for the TCA cycle to have fuel in producing ATP for the body.